For those of you who have never joined a TRAC event before, TRAC is the Terrorism, Transnational Crime and Corruption Center at the Shar School of Policy and Government at George Mason University. TRAC is the first center in the United States devoted to understanding the links among terrorism, transnational crime and corruption and it conducts teaching, research, and training to help formulate policy on these critical issues. TRAC also houses the Anti-Illicit Trade Institute, otherwise known as AITI, uh, which is a global hub for research and training to fight a multi-trillion dollar illegal economy. And you'll hear a little bit about that uh, in a short while from Alan when he talks about the situation in Namibia. So Alan uh, is, uh, Alan Muketala is our fellow uh, for the Community Solutions Program Practicum, otherwise called CSP. This is a, Depar a U.S. Department of State sponsored exchange program that's implemented by IREX, a global development and education organization here in Washington, DC. CSP is a professional leadership development program that brings early to mid-career international fellows together between the ages of 25 to 38 and from over 90 countries to the US for professional collaboration. Unfortunately, this year, because of the COVID pandemic, uh, we have been conducting our practicum with Alan uh, virtually, and the entire program overall is being conducted virtually this year. Our, our hope is that Alan will be coming to the U.S. next spring, along with all the other fellows in his cohort, and mm -hmm. uh, that uh, all of us who are hosts to these amazing fellows will be able to meet them in person and um, at least have some exchange in person. The fellows in the CSP program focus on one of four issues, environmental issues, peace and conflict resolution, women and gender, and transparency and accountability. Alan has chosen to focus on transparency and accountability based on his own work and interests and concerns for his country and his fellow citizens. So, let me tell you a little bit about our CSP fellow, Alan Muketela. He has been focusing over the past two months on the nexus of corruption and development in his country, particularly in the Zambezi region. And out of his work, he's also found that it's impossible to look at these issues without also looking at natural resource corruption. Alan was one of the founders of a prior youth in initiative called the Zambezi Anti-Corruption Movement. And he's an, an, an entrepreneur and an experienced facilitator in career guidance and financial literacy mentor for junior and secondary schools. I have had the pleasure of being Al, Alan's host uh, for his track practicum. And it's been such a rewarding experience and I really want to acknowledge his hard work, his tenacity, and um, in spite of all the challenging circumstances that he faces on an everyday basis, such as cuts in electricity, sporadic and uh, uh, slow internet speeds, and even now access to uh, running water. You'll hear a little bit about that from Alan himself. We're also really fortunate to have Dr. Alonzo Aguirre with us as our discussant today. And some of you may already know him, but he's the chair and professor at the Department of Environmental Science and Policy at George Mason University. He heads a program of collaborative research that focuses on the ecology of wildlife disease and the links to human health and conservation of biodiversity. He also chairs the University Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee. Dr. Aguirre has worked over the past three decades in 23 countries, focusing on integrative research, transdisciplinarity, professional leadership training, and capacity building. 
He also served as the executive director of the innovative Smithsonian Mason School of Conservation. I'd just like to ask you to be patient in the event that Alan's uh, connection gets cut. If it does, he will quickly reconnect again and um, we will continue uh, the webinar. So please don't go if that happens uh, because you will miss uh, a really important and compelling presentation. And again, please put your questions in the chat. And if you didn't hear this before, please introduce yourselves in the chat. So without further ado, I'd like to hand the floor over to our CSP fellow, Alan Muketela. Uh, thank you, Shazka. I hope everybody can hear me. Okay. Uh, thank you, Shazka, once again for the introduction. Uh, I want to thank everyone who joined us. Um, I see a lot of names here that I can't mention, but just know that I appreciate uh, your, your tenor. Like Shazika have already said, my name is Alan. Um, I'm a Transparency and Accountability uh, Fellow at uh, IREX program, um, Community Solution Program. So today, like she said again, I'm going to be talking to you about um, Namibia, its natural resources, equitable uh, development and corruption. So um, because of some technological issues, I can't share my screen to share the slides, but I'll ask um, Casey to be doing that for me. Alan, and can I that. ask you before you start, please to adjust your screen because we're not seeing all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Is this okay? Yes, thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Okay, like I, I think maybe we can move to the next slide because I already introduced myself. Okay, yes, we are going to be talking about Namibia. Just um, the second slide, the next slide, please. Yes, we are going to be talking about Namibia. Namibia is found in, for those of you who have not been in Africa, we are found in the southern in southern Africa. We are borders to Angola, um, Zambia, South Africa, including the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, we are about a population of about 2.5, and we have a length um, about 800 uh, 24,292 um, square kilometers. We are also rich in natural resources like uh, diversity of wild fauna and flora, diamonds, uranium, lead, copper, zinc, and natural gas, as well as fish fisheries. Next slide. Yes, um, so for, 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 for everyone to understand um, Namibia and where we are, our development, corruption, and everything. I thought maybe I might, I should just give you a brief history about Namibia, where we come from and where we are right now. Uh, we were colonized by Germany. That was in between um, 19, 1883 up to 1919 in May, when we were handed over to South Africa. So during our struggle to break away from South Africa, by then, I, I think it should also be important for you to know that uh, Namibia was divided into two by then. There was Namibia. If you have checked the, the last slide that we just moved from, you'd see that the Zambezi, where I am from, is that narrow finger that breaks out from, from, the, from Namibia. So it was that part and then the rest of Namibia. So in Namibia, uh, Namibia was uh, led by, by Swapo, which is mostly, Namibia is mostly dominated by Oshuambo speaking people, the Ovaherero, the Damaras, and the Africanas. So during the struggle, um, people from the south, which is Namibia, which was Southwest Africa, 
and people from Katima here where I am from Zambezi, which was called Capri. Um, in 1964, they met uh, on political parties that was Swapo and Kanu. Kanu that means uh, Caprivi uh, African Union, African National Union, merged on on on. On, on the condition that after they fought for, for independence, then Swapo would let that finger that I've been talking about to be independent on its own, to be a country, and Namibia remain as a country. But then um, it, it should also be important to know that uh, Kanu was led by Mishek Nyongo, while Swapo was led by Dr. Sem Nayoma. So after they merged, they became, Kanu was uh, dissolved, and they became Swapo, and then Mishek Miongo became the vice president. Can we please move to the next slide? <laughs> yes, on the 21st of March, 1990, we got our independence, and Sem Nayoma was our first president. By then, the president could only lead uh, for two years maximum, but then I don't know what happened, in 19, at the end of his two terms, in 1998, he brought a motion to parliament that they amend um, the constitution to allow him to run for president for the third term. Yeah, which, like I said from the beginning that uh, the southern part is, is, um, is mostly populated by Oshivambo people. And you should also know that this, the, the president by then, Dr. Sem Nayoma, is also one of them. So them being the majority in the parliament by then, they voted for him to be, they voted for the motion. And then he was re-elected re to, to, to rule again for the third term. And after that happened, I think Mishek Myongo now, seeing that uh, there were injustice happening. The guy who had agreed in 1964 that they will share leadership, that they will develop uh, the country equally. But looking at the two terms that Dr. Sem Nayoma had saved in Namibia, in the Zambezi, there was no development that has been done in the two terms. And then he still wanted to continue being the president. So Dr. Um, Mr. Muyongo broke away from Swapo. He joined the political, uh, the opposite party, which, is, which was um, DTA by then, uh, the Democratic Tunihari Alliance. And with the support of the Mafue people in the Caprivi, um, he wanted to fight for, 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 for the Caprivi independence away from Swapo, but then he did not succeed. Can we move to the next slide? Yes. Um, I think from the two slides that we have just shared uh, on, on the history, you could see, I just wanted you to, to have uh, at least a view of where our corruption started from. First, our, pres our first president was supposed to lead just for, to, to rule just for two terms. And then because they were the majority in parliament, they voted for, 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 for him to rule for the, third, um, for the third term, even though they saw that in the two terms that he led, he neglected some other parts of Namibia. And then they still allowed him to, to rule, even though some other Namibians were, were not happy. Um, next slide, please. Yes. Uh, the case that I'm going to share with you now, uh, which is part of the corruption that has been happening, um, this scandal, which is called the fish rod scandal, it started as early as when he was still in office in the 90s. But then there was, there was no proper monitoring to see how it was going, how quotas were allocated, and um, who was benefiting and who was... Um, being affected. So the fish rod scandal up to the 2000s, I think in 2019, 
2019, uh, the fish rod scandal was unearthed. Um, uh, is the, excuse me, I need to drink water. Just a Yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm a little bit nervous. The fish rod scandal was unearthed in, 19, uh, in 2019. Uh, this uh, scandal was the largest that we have ever seen in Namibia that has been disclosed. Um, it involves a company that is found in, in Iceland by the name of uh, Sam Harry, like you can see on the screen. This, according to the report that, uh, we are looking at Namibian Swapo and some other political uh, leaders got about 10 million Namibian dollars, US dollars, I mean, not Namibian, US dollars from in forms of bribes uh, from the, the, just in exchange for fishing quotas in Namibia. Uh, the reports also uh, say uh, sure. According to the report, uh, which was done by the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, this same company, after, bribe, after paying a lot of um, dollars to Namibia, millions of dollars to Namibia to Swapo, they started invading tax. They started uh, taking money to countries like Cyprus and Mauritius. Uh, Mauritius is just uh, an island close to South Africa. And then after this whole thing uh, was discovered, several of Namibian's top political officials were arrested, including uh, the Minister of Fisheries by then, Bernard Aysau, the, minister, the former Minister of Justice, Shangara, and then Fishko, um, Fishko uh, uh, representative uh, high to quality. But they, after being uh, after being interrogated, they denied uh, their wrongdoing. Can we please go to the next slide? Yes, during the the whole process of investigating the their scandal. 27 properties were, were found which were purchased during the, 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 the years that this whole thing was happening. And from then, Namibia as High Court has been trying to, to resolve this whole thing, but then uh, it has been moved to January uh, next year, 2022. And according to reports by this, the, same the, the same organization that I just mentioned, um, the, the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Agents uh, Project, they are saying that um, some of president's uh, advisors and the president himself are being investigated for being involved in this uh, uh, scandal. Can you please move to the next slide? Yeah. In, in June, 2021, this year, the whistleblower who is uh, none other than uh, sure. Sorry, I part of my screen is blocked. Yeah, the whistleblower who is Johannes was awarded with a uh, with a uh, uh, um, an award for 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 risking his life to. To, to put this whole uh, investigation together for supporting, for bringing documents and um, putting it out for Al Jazeera. I think it was in Namibia, it was broadcasted by Al Jazeera. And I think you can see on the links, if it's not shared, I'll, uh, I'll share it later so that you can watch the full video of uh, the work that he has done. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please.
Yeah. So that was just uh, one of, of, of the major uh, corruption scandals that has been happening since independence. Um, from, from independence that the ruling party has been doing. And the second one that we are going to be talking about right now is um, timber, the harvest, the illegal harvesting of timber in, in, in Zambezi and in, 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 in Kavango. Kavango is just found after Zambezi, you get into Zambezi going south, going to Namibia. So the same organization that has, that invested, that has some information on the fish rod, has also information and it's the one that investigated on, on this one, uh, organized crime and corruption reporting project. Um, they found um, how this whole thing started. Um, in 2005, there's vasty land in, in Kavango with uh, a lot of timber. So what the government did or what the ruling party did was to, they leased land to a lot of politicians. They were saying that this land was going to be used for, 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 for farm settlement, even though this land um, is approved that it can't be, it can be used for crops, it can be used for grazing for animals, but then they still list it just for people to keep. A little did we, I think little did the people know that uh, this war was just a scheme looking forward to, 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 to some illegal harvesting of rosewood and stuff. Okay, so illegal um, logging is leading to plunder of three protective uh, hardwood species in Africa. It's, uh, this has been happening, like I've said, in Zambezi, where I come from, and some parts of, 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 of Kavango. Thousands of protected trees that have been illegally cut down on land, on land list at settlement farms to political elite uh, and war veterans by, by Namibian uh, ruling party, like I've said. Um, can you please go to the next slide? According to, 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 to the agents that has been reporting on this, in 2016, a Chinese World Cup logger started shipping um, timber from Angola and from Zambia. I was so astonished when, uh, when I read about this and found out, because uh, they have a plant, I think somewhere in Zambezi here where, where I am. If you see from the, the pictures that are taken, the, the top one there, I took it, I think the day before yesterday when I was, um, when I was doing uh, my, my, my research on this. Um, his, when he started illegal harvesting in Angola and in, in Zambia, he would bring and transport them to, to the plant here in Zambezi, where he was processing them for them to be transferred, going to Swako, uh, to Valvish Bay, to be exported to, to China and stuff. So in 2017, I think, uh, I don't know whether there was some investigation going on, but then he was called to, to law. After being called to law, uh, this guy, he involved, uh, he involved uh, a, 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 a director from the Ministry of, of Forest who helped him, the same person who helped him with the plant here. Um, they, they moved. I think he, he, he organized for him some, some, some permits for him to start uh, uh, harvesting from, from Zambezi and then harvesting from, from Kavango. But then before that happened, uh, the report said 10,000, almost 10,000 tons of wood have been exported already going to China. Uh, Namibia is a, a signatory to conservation on international trade in, in, in engaged species of wild fauna and flora, which banned international trade in, in rosewood in 2017. But in 2001, uh, Forest Act normally protects all 
the 2001 Act, uh, Forest Act, normally protects uh, all indigenous um, hardwood tree species. Can we please move, move to the next slide? Okay, let's move to the, the previous slide, sorry. To the, the previous slide. Yeah. So when this guy was found in, in like I was saying, when he was caught here in, and called to law in, in 2017, because what happened was that you, after he, I think maybe there were a lot of charges for him to be crossing the borders with the lords and stuff. He started illegal cutting of harvesting of this uh, wood here in Gaptima without the permission, like I've said. And then after that, when he was called to law here, he relocated going to, to Kavango. To Kavango where he also started with, like I've said, Kavango has been the allocated land to politicians. So those politicians occupying land that is not used for, for crop planting or for animal grazing, they started selling uh, the same thing. I think according to reports up to, they were getting about 1.4 US, uh, 1.4 million US dollars every year. Each farmer was making up to 1.4 million dollars every year in, 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 in Kavango. Yeah, so we can see all these things, they started long time from when the first president was still in office, moving from uh, moving up to when the second and the third president took over, who is still uh, ruling up to now, who is Hage Gengo. What made it worse was that um, during his campaign, during his campaign uh, in 20, he, he made the, a ruling that uh, all those who have harvested wood, like what you can see now, they can, they had permission to sell this wood. And it also just brought uh, another, uh, uh, another, uh, how can I put it? People started uh, harvesting even some more. Even though uh, a lot were harvested, a lot was just in the factories, like piles that you can see. These ones up to now, as, I, as we speak right now, they are still here in Katima, they are, they are not sold. I don't know what has happened. I don't know if these Chinese guys are still coming back, but then they were given a mandate that they are free to sell them. Apart from, apart from even though they were being told uh, by, by the ministry that they were no, all the illegal uh, harvested logs, they were not going to go anywhere. But because of uh, elections, he put a new mandate that they can be sold. Yes, please, can you go to the next slide? Yes, uh, that was just uh, two of the, uh, the national um, corruption cases that I have, I have studied that I wanted to share with you. Now I'm going to move to some corruption that is happening, that, that are happening here in Zambezi region where I am from. Um, and I would like, uh, I would, I would like uh, Let's see, just to play the video, just to at least for you to have some some relation to to, to, to Zambezi region where I am from. AC, we're not getting the sound. I don't know if there's any, yeah. if the volume can be increased. Oh, 
you have to put the sound through Zoom. The um, the Zoom uh, the Zoom uh, help gives you a, a way to put the sound through Zoom. The Zambezi region, formerly known as the Caprivi, is the only region Fantastic. in Namibia Thank that you. shares its. I'm sorry, did that do it? Yes, you did it. Thank you. Borders with three other countries, namely Angola, Botswana, and Zambia. The Zambezi region is a tropical area with high temperatures and much rainfall during the rainy season, making it the wettest region in Namibia. With its rich, diverse cultures, spectacular open waterways, abundant bird and wildlife, the Zambezi region welcomes you. Thank you. Okay, like I've said, we are, we are moving from uh, the national corruption to regional. I'm going to be talking to you about Zambezi. Like I've said in the, uh, in the first slides, Zambezi, which was um, firstly known as uh, Caprivi, is one of the 14 regions of Namibia, is located in the extreme northeast um, of the country. Uh, it's, also, it's called uh, Caprivi, it was called Caprivi from independence up to 2013 when it was changed to Zambezi, the name that we get from the Zambezi River that uh, is be in between us and, and, and Zambia. Um, like the, the, the clip that she just played, Zambezi is the only one of the regions in, in, in Namibia that shares uh, borders with um, Botswana, Zambia, and Angola. Um, can you please move to the next slide? Yes. Okay. Um, I think the history of corruption in, 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 in Caprivi, in Zambezi, has its roots from what happened after the 1999 uh, elections. Like, I, I, if you still remember, I told you that in 1964, there was a, a, a political party that came from Caprivi, and then one that was representing Namibia, which was Swapo. Kanu, which was for Caprivians, and then Swapo, which was for Namibians. They merged um, in agreement that uh, after the struggle, Capri was going to be let alone and then Namibia be on its own. But then uh, after two terms of ruling, the first president couldn't let go of Zambezi, neither could she do anything to develop it. That brought about Muyongo now breaking away from the ruling party. And then he came um, after a lot of uh, campaigns to vote for him as president in DTA, he failed. And then now he came now and then he formed what is now called, uh, what was called CLA, the Caprivi Liberation Army. Moyongo's aim was that um, if Caprivi couldn't be um, freed by talks like sitting on the table with uh, the Swapo officials, Maybe if he can use force, maybe something can happen. And then he formed Cla, Cla. and then Cla um, attacked attacked uh, in in 1999, 3 August. They attacked in Katima, attacking the military base, the police station, and the radio. Um, the attack was not successful. The idea of the attack was not successful. They thought maybe they can overcome and then break away Caprivi from the rest of Namibia, but they were not. So after that, uh, because, can, can you please move to the next slide as I explained. After that, because um, like I've said, 
Muyongo has his support in Caprivi by his kinsmen, his uh, his trustmen, the Mafwe, um, who helped him. They were support. They were in support. Even uh, a lot of them were in the the Caprivi liber liberation army. So after that, his attempt, uh, the Mafwe's were not trusted by the ruling party. Um, in Zambezi, we have about um, uh, almost like uh, five to six tribes. We have the Mafwe's, we have the Sobias, we have uh, the Mayeyi people, we have um, the Totelas, we have the Lozis. Yeah, so, but then the most popular or the most pop uh, powerful ones, it's the Mafwe and the Subias. So these other ones, they, they just, it's either they support Mafwe or they support the Subias. So after what happened in 1999, the attacks, the Mafwe's, they were not trusted by the government. The Subias were trusted because when they were planning for cutting uh, Caprivi away from Namibia, they remained with, um, with Swapo. One of the reasons was that uh, Sobias do not have much land in, in, in Zambezi. Most of their lands are, are, are they're affected by floods and uh, Malfoy's are the ones we, we have land. So because Sobias remained with the ruling party, um, they were the ones who could be trusted even with uh, political positions. Um, those high positions that the, the, the decision-making uh, positions in, in the region. So as they became in power, powered by the ruling party, um, the Sobias, I think they couldn't, with the fact that they don't have much land in Zambezi, it was very difficult for them to, 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 to develop Zambezi because they had the idea that if they, they develop the, the region, the Mafia could get strength and uh, come again and then try to separate it from, 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 from Namibia. And then they could maybe be chased because they supported Swapo. So this was the idea that was adopted even with uh, the Swapo uh, uh, leadership, that they also started neglecting Zambezi from independence up to now, it's neglected. Uh, with They used the idea that they can't develop this place because uh, they might be developing it for Muyongo, who's now in, 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 in exile. So a lot of money has been, of course, on, on, on their budgets. Katima is still there, as a Zambezi region is still there. But then what is sad is that uh, the money that is uh, always put aside for Zambezi is not used for, for, for development in Zambezi. It's used by just uh, um, some individuals who, who, who take the money and they use it to enrich themselves. Uh, can you please move to the next slide as we, we talk more on, 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 on the corruption that is happening in the region? Um, the land not for the poor. Yeah, in, 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 like I've said, we get uh, like equally funds for development from, from the central government. In 2017, uh, Katima Town Council demolished about uh, they demolished houses that were illegal, that they claimed that were erected illegally on the land that was earmarked for development. Um, when the CEO, the guy who's on the right on the slide, when he was asked for a comment, he said, urban land was not for, for poor people, it was for sale, which was um, a bit uh, controversial because you see, Despite of Zambezi having receiving money every time, every year since independence from the central government, nothing has been done here. We don't have serviced land that the people can, the, the land that you are saying that it's for sale, that people can, can buy and build. We don't have serviced roads. We don't have, as you will see as we go in, in, in the slides. Can we please uh, move to the next slide as I explained? Uh, the money that has been given every year, nobody knows what is being used. Because 
if we were uh, to to demand for books now, it's millions every year that comes to Zambezi to develop Zambezi, but nothing has been done. Like you see in the picture, in 2019, after just barely a year in between, after demolishing, 2019, um, they came again, they said they found a location for the people who were homeless, the ones that they chased on the other side. Before I, I talk about this one, it's important for you to know that the land that they were saying that was earmarked for development, I wanted to forget this one. Um, up to now, as we speak today, there's nothing that has been done on the land. And the other thing was that, that I have discovered is that, uh, you see, yes, there was some illegal grabbing that has happened. But then after Helen, can you hear us? You're frozen. Can you give us a second, everyone? We'll just try to see what's going on. Alan seems to have left his off the list of per, uh, attendance now. So the internet might have gotten cut. I know he's going to be trying to restart it. Um, I wonder, Alonzo, I know that Alan can't hear you, but is there anything at this juncture that you would just want to mention? Yeah, I can take yeah. over a little bit. Uh, thank you everyone for your patience and, and the great invitation. I've been involved with uh, Dr. Uh, Shelley and track for several years. Uh, at least uh, nine, I arrived at Mesa in 2011. Uh, and uh, corruption is one of those things that we take as a given in, in the sense that depending on where you come from, I grew up in Mexico, a highly corrupted country, if not in the top 10, maybe higher. Um, uh, and uh, listening to uh, Alan's conversation, the issues seem to me very similar across the board. Uh, not only with wildlife and natural resources, but also with drugs, guns, and everything linked uh, to corruption. So in a conversation with my father who passed away a, while, uh, a few years ago, uh, I was about 10 years old when I saw a cop getting a bill from a driver passing a red light. And so he said, you know, son, corruption uh, is uh, an issue we have to deal forever uh, because uh, everybody has the right price, meaning everybody can be bought out, doesn't matter uh, the amount of money. Uh, and that stuck uh, with me for many years uh, until recently talking to track and ways to begin uh, dealing with corruption at all points and sense. And overall, uh, my passion has been working for wildlife conservation. While a species, I became a veterinarian because I didn't want to work with humans. Of course, 90% of my work has to do with humans if you even want to touch an animal. So um, corruption is so embedded in uh, the genes of people, doesn't matter the country. We see it probably in the US, we see it probably in Russia, we see it probably in in Iraq, Iran, and all African countries, all Latin America. So it seems to me that there are many ways to deal with it. 
And um, we have the opportunity now with these young scientists, new fellows, to begin uh, develop new frameworks to work with corruption. So uh, this year we're still part of the NRC, uh, uh, USAID um, initiative that funded specifically uh, corruption at our resources. Uh, and we need to figure out better ways to communicate and the next generation change their ways about corruption. And so, so it's going to take a long time to change that behavior. And I think becomes part of the culture. And that's the most difficult part to deal with, right? How can we change the culture? Uh, specifically about Namibia, I can tell you, uh, tell you interesting things. I hope that Alan could be here, but he knows better than I do. I was mean, just thinking about it. I haven't been there yet. I've been to surrounding countries, uh, especially South Africa, uh, but it's the world's second least densely populated country in Africa with a population of about three people per square kilometer. So there's very few people. Uh, has the world's highest sand dunes, the largest meteorite, and the largest concentration of rock petroglyphs. Namibia has a vast country with magnificent scenery, beauty, and will preserve natural habitats. And he just showed a little glimpse of it as we were speaking. Also, the country is rich in fauna and flora, as he said. He showed elephants and rhinos and hippos. Many endemic species are concentrated along the west coast in the Namib desert, who is which is the largest desert in the planet. So, so these uh, resources really enrich the country through uh, tourism, ecosystem services provided. So opens a huge window for this uh, illegal trade, for this uh, selling of illegal goods and, and the corruption avenue of what's happening to biodiversity, to species, ecosystems and natural resources. Uh, interestingly, uh, it's very dry, one of the driest countries in the world doesn't have hardly any river. He showed that blooming during the spring when water comes down, but then most uh, of the citizens of Namibia require under, underground water, so it's not easily available to them. So uh, interestingly, it's the first country to, in Africa to integrate uh, environmental protection into their constitution. So that's an amazing uh, contribution and has the largest populations of cheetahs and black rhinos. So I see Shaska, is he back yet? Yes, yes, Alan anyway, is back. So, so I just wanted to give you some points on Namibia or the beautiful Thank country you. it is and some of the issues on corruption, and then, then I'll take over when I have to. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Aguirre. Okay, Alan, the floor is back to you. Sorry that I had to leave my, my computer, just um, shut down, and then uh, there was some in interference here. Someone was trying to intimidate me, but it's okay now. Yeah, um, maybe I can just start from where I left. Yeah, in, like I was saying, in 2019, in 2019, town council, um, I was saying that on the on the land that they removed, the, the illegal, um, the grabbers, the land grabbers, one thing that caught my attention was that um, right now, as we speak, the land has been some plots there that the people that were just left, they are being sold by some staff from town council without uh, the public knowing. They are being sold and then people who are buying are told not to say anything and not to build anything just yet until they say so. So you can see that um, these people were trying, they chased them. They chased the people that they said were occupying it illegal, illegally. And then after they went, they started selling the plots over the land that they were claiming that was earmarked for development. And like I said, the land is still just bare. 
just like how they have left it. And then um, nothing is done. Can you please move to the next slide? I hope you can hear me. Yeah. Um, where, the, where the people, where they took the people from, from the other location, um, there were promises that within a year, there were going to be developments that were going to happen. Um, they were promised water, they were promised electricity, they were promised um, uh, uh, roads. But as we speak right now, after I'm done, uh, she's going to play the video so you see what I'm saying. As we speak right now, nothing has been done on, on the land. The people, as you can see from, from the video there, uh, lined up containers, they still wait for them to come receive water. They still walk to go collect firewood for, for, for them to use. Um, they are still in the dark. Those who have cars, they find it very difficult for them to drive up to their houses up to now. Can you, maybe you can play a video so that you can see what I'm talking about. Yeah, nothing is said in the video. It's just for you to, to have an idea of what I'm saying. <laughs> That is the new location in town. It looks like uh, some settlement in, 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 in the rural areas. It's one of town's uh, settlement. Thank you, Casey. Okay, uh, I'm going to talk uh, again on the corruption in the town's water system. Uh, let's go to the next slide. I don't know if you can see that, but in, in 2018, um, something that happened in Katima was that um, the town council gave a multi-million uh, dollar um, a, a tender to a Chinese-owned company. They gave him a tender to buy and to come install uh, uh, um, uh, 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 how do you call them again? Uh, um, some water gauges. So according to the law of Namibia, if such kind of services, are, if the town or any municipal setup happens to do something like that, you first have to notify the people by writing that you are going to change uh, meters or you are going to install anything in, in, in their properties. The second thing is that if you don't write to them, you should host meetings. These meetings must be done after you have done campaigns, um, after you have done uh, notifications around town and they are signed by at least 10 people from, 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 from the town council. And then the other thing was that the tender itself, the way it, it was given, it was fake though. It was not advertised for locals to at least bid for it. It was not, um, locals were not given a chance at least to do something about it. But then um, it was, they just gave it to this man who bought um, gauges from, from, from China. And then they started installing them. Can you please move, move to, to the next slide? Yes, as you can see on the slide, on the left, you can see um, what I'm talking about. Uh, the, the, the gauges in, it, we are talking about in China, this is the wholesaler in China online. In China, they, they are about, they cost around about 300, 400 Namibian dollars. But here, people were paying about between 3,000 to 7,000 just for those things. And, you know, what is uh, fascinating is that, you know, as we speak right now, we have people who couldn't afford these things. They they still, up to now, they don't have water on their houses. And... Uh, 
you know, it's 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 disturbing that uh, even after this happened, um, just some some weeks ago, I think it was uh, two weeks ago, water was cut in 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 in, in Katima. When the residents asked for the reason, so said um, uh, it's because of the water meters in question that the company that had provided these water meters from China to here, that town council still owes the money. So town council has to, to pay those millions to the company before they can allow them to, to keep using the meters. So what we have, uh, discovered is that these meters are controlled. I don't know how they are doing it, but they are controlled from China. That's what I heard. And then someone was even joking, like, if town council doesn't have answers for us, and the company that was installing these meters doesn't have answers for us, who should we call? Should we call China? You see? <clears throat> and then after this whole thing in 2018 happened, I think the residents, um, it got to them that they, 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 they protested against it. If you can see the next slide. Uh, Casey, next slide. Yeah. So after they protested, he, the man in question, the one who's leading town council, the CEO was arrested. But then after getting arrested, I think he spent about five days in jail and then he got out on bail since his release this case has not been uh, they have not looked at it uh if you ask people in high offices about what happened to it they are saying that it was it was stolen so nothing basically can happen now well Okay, I think Alan is having another interruption. Let me see if I can reach him on his phone. If everyone would please hang on. His presentation is coming to an end right now and we're going to move the, to the discussion and the opportunity for you to ask him questions. So could I ask everyone to Yeah, this was his last slide. He's not picking up. Um, so I know he'll he'll call me back in a in a moment. Um would Alonzo, would you like to yeah, start like to just with yeah, some like reactions? I would like to continue please. on some of the points I was making on corruption. Mm -hmm. It is not a country, a local problem, uh, a country problem, continental problem, but it's a world and global problem. Uh, China was mentioned as a culprit, and China has been definitely involved in a lot of these issues across the world. Uh, recently, specifically with vaquita, an extremely endangered species of purpose that's linked to totoaba, um, a fish uh, similar to the dolphin tuna relationship. And totoaba has a huge uh, swim bladder. So all of a sudden, totoaba became an item because the huge swim bladder is going to provide you with this magnificent power to reproduce to sexually be active or to to <laughs> whatever you know it, it is one of those things uh, and so china as their economic power grows is going to keep influencing um the wildlife trade um and not only wildlife trade but the drug trade the guns trade and any trade related to natural resources and it's something we have to deal on a more global level. We cannot just approach this country by country by country as we have done in the past. 
So we need to form a coalition and a network to begin dealing with these issues because the three are very close together. And I'm talking about drugs, guns, and wildlife. And all those three are linked together. You heard of Escobar after his pass and bringing a high hippos to Colombia. Now hippos to cover uh, basically the most important rivers and they can't get rid of hippos. It's a tourist attraction now, but they're having massive environmental impact in the country. So, so we see all those impacts moving forward long-term. I have some specific questions on corruption to Alan, but um, uh, interestingly, we know that the uh, places humans get involved are the ones driving uh, biodiversity loss. And I just said earlier before, before uh, Alan joined again, that Namibia set up the first environmental protection uh, laws into their constitution. So extremely to me, that's important. And it's fantastic. Uh, in fact, Mexico has one of the best environmental protection regulations in the world. The problem is enforcement. And when you get enforcement involved, they're also corrupt. <laughs> so it is uh, something we need have to deal with long-term. And that's linked to what we're seeing now with the pandemic. People don't want to go back to work. And if they want to go back to work, they want double salaries. Instead of 15, they want 25, 30 dollars. Instead of going physically to work, they want to work from home. So, so we're learning new ways to deal with this, and I'm sure we have better ways to deal with these corrupt systems. It's going to take a long time. However, Namibia right now has the largest concentrations of cheetahs, about 3,000, and black rhinos who are extremely endangered. So, so I had a few questions for Alan if he joined, but I'll be happy to address some of the questions that uh, they've been submitting so far. So I let Shaska uh, decide if I can answer some of those questions. Thank you, Alonza. Alan is back with us, thankfully. Perfect. So uh, please go ahead. Alonso, if you have any questions to ask uh, Alan. So, Alan, thank you for your presentation. It was uh, very good. Uh, trends follow what we know on corruption. Uh, and I said uh, what we know a little bit about your beautiful country. And, and as an activist with first-hand experience concerning transnational corruption, related to natural resources and wildlife that, that we've been talking about it for a while. What do you think must be done in Namibia in order for the government, NGOs, or other institutions to tackle it? What do we need to do to avoid the issues of, of the fish uh, example that you presented? Do you hear me? So you're frozen again. Your mic is off. Alan, if you want to close your video, that's okay. Yeah, close if your you... video, open your mic. And and um, yes, your mic is muted. Oh, I think we lost them. I think we lost Alan again. Okay. Um, okay. So Let my comment see. was mm -hmm. dealing with uh, how we're going to deal with this. Uh, at the local government, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and um, how can we move beyond what other governments have been done in the area? Uh, interestingly, as I said, Namibia is one of the least populated countries uh, in the planet. Three people per square kilometer. So that's like a paradise, isn't it? But we need now already, we see an exploitation of the resources uh, in massive ways, not only fish, but now uh, forest and everything else. And there's no water. And water is coming uh, to be the most important resource across the planet in many countries. Uh, probably the first on top. Do we have them back? 
We don't have Alan back, unfortunately. Okay, the audience but may have some questions for me, and then, for or, you? or you can use some of those questions if I can answer them. Okay, that's a great idea. And also, um, we had a chance to speak with Alan a little bit beforehand, and uh, Casey Kennard, our uh, track colleague, has also volunteered to just share a little bit about what Alan was telling us prior to the uh, the webinar starting. And if Alan comes back on, then we'll um, give him the floor. And if he's not able to get the connection back, uh, then we will um, end in after uh, Casey and you, Alonzo. Uh, That's fantastic. Yeah, are, no, yeah, I, and I have other yeah. comments if we need yeah. to, but I, I, was, I was hoping to Alan to other yeah. issues. Thank you. And while, while, while Casey's uh, sharing, I will try to reach Alan again while Casey's sharing. Thanks, Shaska, and um, apologies for doing this a little bit on the fly uh, and, and trying to make sure that the points that Alan wanted to make today and that he spent so much time researching and, and putting so much thought and care into that we get those across to the audience today and, and maybe some of those points can make it out into your communities and thinking about how we address uh, some of the issues he's talking about today. Um, the things that he and I spoke about prior to the start of this event were more um, on an international scale than the local issues that, that Alonzo is getting to and the comparisons of, of local community uh, concerns and anti-corruption practices or what could be anti-corruption practices. Um, Alan and I talked a little bit about how if you were to just do research on Namibia, um, and you look at, say, multinational organizational rankings around development and income, um, Namibia tends to rank well. It's considered middle income, developing. Um, it's not terribly high in terms of rankings of corruption perceptions and things like that. But in reality, uh, sometimes it, it is a country that's overlooked, partly because of the things that Alonzo talked about, uh, low population density and things like that. So it's assumed that it's in a better situation in terms of corruption than it really is, and that it's not got, gotten the international attention that would be due for the amount of corruption that uh, is actually taking place in that location. Um, we also talked a bit about similarities and where things are dissimilar with its neighbors. It's very easy to, to take the countries of Southern Africa that are smaller in population or market share than its neighbor, like South Africa, and lump them all together. Um, and those, those relationships are um, challenging and sometimes dependent, but it's also not fair in terms of understanding Namibia to lump it all together with its neighbors. It shares some historical um, relevance or, or uh, context, um, particularly around uh, colonialism and racism in, in that, it, that might compare to South Africa, um, but is com uh, comparable in terms of um, population and population density with neighbors like Botswana, but it is not exactly like either one um, and should be seen as, as unique and examined and researched. Uh, in that way, unique of its neighbors. Uh, so those were the two big points that he and I went over this morning and in and, and thinking about how to bring attention to the issues of corruption, uh, particularly around development, unequal development and natural resources uh, in, in Namibia and, and how to bring that um, more attention. Uh, it does look like Alan might be with us without video, which would be fine. Please keep your video off and see if we are able to maintain uh, contact with you. Are you with us, Alan? Doesn't sound like it yet. Uh, Alonzo, those are the points that I wanted to make sure did not get lost today in this discussion. That, that, that's very good. Um, and thank you, Casey. So basically, I wanted to ask Alan let me put my video on. Um, 
what uh, as an activist will be concerning transnational corruption related to natural resources in wildlife? What can be done in Namibia and other governments to tackle it? Uh, however, it's a, probably a, a tricky question because we know what's happening. So um, maybe Shaska can see some of the questions coming in that we can address uh, from my point of view. Thank you, Alonzo. I see that we have, that Alan is here, but he's not able to respond. Uh, so I'm going to see if, if we have some questions that will be um, pertaining to you. And I think that one of the big questions for Namibia and, and other and other countries in the region is, see, I'm getting a text from Judy. Okay, is really, you talked about how we need to have a holistic transnational approach to uh, transnational corruption. And because we always think about transnational crime and transnational corruption, but and we also do think to some extent about a transnational approach, but beyond measures uh, uh, that have to do with, um, for example, uh, memoranda of understanding like in energy or in different fields of natural resource extraction. Are there any suggestions that you have that of new approaches at the transnational level to tackle this kind of transnational corruption dealing with natural resource extraction. And so, this can be, and it can be for civil society, it can be for governments, it can be for whatever, but it would be really great to get your insights on that. Uh, that that's a very, very important question, Shaska, because we've been talking about for years about this transnational approach to things. We have created these, uh, non-governmental uh, agencies like IUCN, mm -hmm. like um, those agencies integrating climate. Uh, a big COP26 is coming up and I'm gonna be there. I don't know why I'm gonna be there, but I'm gonna be there. Uh, anyway, uh, there are many fora that we can talk about it. So that my, from my point of view from wildlife, what I see is CITES, for example, the, the, for the trade of endangered species. So CITES as a rule works when the species goes out of the country and if you are a member country. So, uh, so we have some regulations with CITES. IUCN is the body that regulates all that for endangered species, talking about wildlife. But we don't have a specific frameworks to deal of how uh, countries internally mm -hmm. can share the data globally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's going to mm -hmm. take a long time to figure out. I'm going to tell you why. For example, H5N1, highly pathogenic avian influenza that hit us back in 2007 killing chickens globally, killing birds globally, killing uh, dogs globally, and thinking that will be a massive outbreak globally if it turned back into humans, uh, countries didn't want to share the data. They said, no, no. If I tell you I have H5N1 as a strain of avian influenza, I won't be able to sell my chickens. So no, no, I'm, I'm, we are free of the disease. And that's the problem. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we need to figure out what the country is willing to share to be able to become a global problem. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. we don't have any yeah. entities yet to say, mm -hmm. okay, we can deal with transnational crime because now everybody's open. And that's the issue. Is the word sounds fantastic, but it doesn't work right now, mm -hmm. from my point of view. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much uh, for that input. I'll just mention to everyone that uh, Alan uh, is somewhat connected, but um, 
his uh, it's coming in and out. So we are going to um, end now. Um, unfortunately, Alan will not have an opportunity to have a conversation with all of you and with uh, Professor Aguirre. Um, but I think to, I mean, the, the point to end on is that the difficulties that he's facing to communicate shows how clearly um, yes. the challenges that exist to engage with communities and committed citizens who are trying to tackle these problems and the support that they need uh, to, from those on the outside who want to be uh, allies, uh, this support is critical. And um, that support is in terms of their connectivity, it's in terms of their exposure, giving them platforms like this to talk, and also to enforcing policies and enforcing um, international conventions. So for example, not just to name Namibia, but so many countries are signatories to a variety of conventions, uh, including the United Nations Convention on, Corrupt on Corruption, Against Corruption and other things. But what else, but leave, we need to leave with the thought that those of us on the outside who are allies, um, in spite of all our efforts, we need to do more to think about how we are going to support enforcement and implementation and bring this up to the policymakers in our own countries who are interacting with governments who are engaging in development activities at the multilateral level. And um, I'm very sorry that Alan cannot connect again because um, he has been the one doing this research, putting himself to, at risk to go to, especially in his uh, area. And um, he's sending us his phone number so people can feel free to reach him if they want. Uh, it's in the chat. Um, but uh, I'd like to thank Alan for all the work he's done in the past two months under such difficult conditions, his courage. And I'd like to thank uh, Professor Aguirre also uh, for joining us today. And um, I hope that we can continue the conversation and I hope that IREX will be able to bring all their community service uh, practicum fellows back to Washington in spring of next year so that we can meet him and some of the others in person. Thank just, you, everyone. Uh, just got yes? please share my email. So if you have any questions, it is important to know that uh, these issues go across boundaries and we, the, yes. we learn it will be better, better. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, do you want me to um, share your email right now or would you like to, sh did, um, or with Alan? I don't know or? if I can text it. I just see only, I mean, I can put it in the chat. Okay. Okay. If you put it in the chat, that will be great. I know some of many, um, some of the people here will know how to reach you, but for those who cannot, that would be great. And uh, hopefully this is the beginning of a conversation. And the end of a webinar, but the beginning of a conversation and at the beginning of communication. Absolutely. Alan, if by any chance you can hear me before we end the session now, please unmute and um, give us the last word. I see Alan has unmuted. Uh, okay. Yes. Um, I just wanted to say uh, thank you so much for everyone for attending and for giving me their time just to share um, what is it, what is happening in Namibia. And I just wanted to pass my apology for my network. Uh, I don't know what's going on, but it's been bad. At least now I can hear you and yeah. And then the other thing was, um, there was someone who was trying to intimidate, but then uh, he's gone now. But I just wanted to thank you all for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Alan. We will be in touch uh, after the webinar. I think all of you can appreciate what it's like to actually investigate and try to impact corruption that starts from high up 